For today's lecture, I'm going to be talking about the intersection between genomics and anthropology. In the process of this, I hope we can get a better understanding and appreciation for the intersection between genomics, archaeology, and language, and how they can contribute to understanding some of the important transitions in human history. Additionally, we're going to talk about some of the evidence that places modern humans in southern and eastern Africa, understand how mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA can be used to understand the relationships between modern humans and ancient hominids. Um, uh, using Understanding how we can use DNA sequence to better understand patterns of human migration, and also using uh, genomics to understand organisms that have a close relationship with us, specifically through things like domestication. Organisms like dogs and horses and some plants. So when we think about humans, uh, genomics and anthropology, um, it's important that we understand and have a good definition for what we think of as anthropology. I mean, we're biologists, maybe we don't think about that that much. Um, anthropology in this case is the study of humanity. And if we think about humans, we are one of the most successful species on earth. We can see in this photo, all right, this is the world lit up at night. Um, we can see that humans are basically spreading to almost all parts of the world. Um, and even more than where we are, we can look at the impacts that we have on the world. This is from a Halpern paper in 2008, and this shows human impacts in the ocean, um, which obviously covers more of the Earth's surface than land mass. And what we can see is there is basically virtually no place on Earth that has not been impacted by human activity, at least in marine environments. It's a pretty amazing thing to think about. We are at an incredible amount of impact on this Earth. Um, we continue to have that kind of impact in a wide range of ways. And um, you know, looking at our genomic information can help us understand our history and the impact that we've had on the world around us. So if we think about human as one of the most successful species on Earth, um, we say, well, how might we measure that success or how might we define what, it, what that means? We've had, we have diverse civilizations, both presently and over time. Um, there are diverse languages, diverse belief systems, diverse social structures, and we've really developed an interesting system that um, where we depend on certain cultural innovations to sustain us as a, as a species, um, whether that is the domestication of animals, plants, and microbes, um, the utilization of natural resources, the advent and implementation of industry and commerce, the creation and implementation of healthcare, and the creative activities of humans, of humanity, in which we are generating technology, developing technology. All of this leads, might lead us to the question about, well, what is it that makes us human, and how did we get to where we are today? Um, I don't know if genomics can actually answer all those questions, but it may be able to give us some insight into them. So when you think about what are we doing when we're trying to take into consideration genomics and anthropology, what we're really looking about, again, is that comparative framework. We're looking at similarities and differences, but we're trying to integrate knowledge about genetics, similarity and distances, with knowledge about cultural similarities and distances, differences. So we're trying to see where the overlaps are, where the correlations are, where we might even see causations. Um, and um, if we think about this, one of the things that's really important is understanding the timing of events, right? So we are looking to use things like the archaeological record to anchor genetic divergences or understanding of genetic divergences so that we know what events might be associated with different genetic outcomes. Um, and 
One of the things that we might do here is to take various genetic estimates of something referred to as the most recent common ancestor to anchor various to um, to anchor various cultural events. Uh, and the general concept I think that we need to make sure that we understand in this process is um, based off of something that we refer to as the coalescent. And the coalescent is a, a model of distributed gene divergence in a genealogy used to estimate population parameters. Um, and so if you look over here on the right side, we have a couple examples of what the coalescent could look like. And I think what you want to think about is that, um, you know, as geneticists, if we were to measure genetic information, um, we're going to be measuring it over here in present time, right? But we know that if we were to start with a certain amount of information, right, the model that we um, understand how biology works is one in which we start with a suite of, of samples, of allele samples, and through time, some of those alleles are lost. Like here, we lose allele one, doesn't make it to generation two, right? And other alleles will continue. Sometimes those branches, though, will end. Um, but they'll continue on through time. We'll have new things pop up, either through mutation or drift, right? And we'll also have maybe some barriers occur um, that cause uh, gene flow to be restricted and take our entire gene pool and split it up into different groups. And through this process, we can start to sort of determine, you know, what is the most recent common ancestor between some of these different groups. Um, and what that does is it helps us understand the relationship among these organisms. So if we were to think about the most recent common ancestor between these three species, right, we would trace it back to somewhere here, pretty deep in this coalescent. And that would help us understand the relationship among these different species and how long ago it's been since they diverged. But say we were more interested in saying, well, what is also the difference between, say, species A and species B, right? And here we see that the time since divergence um, is, a, is a lot more, is a lot closer in this regard, right? Where we see the most recent common ancestors actually could be uh, a lot earlier than the one for all three species. Um, and what this shows us is that um, we can use this model of branching and gene loss and, and gene and allele expansion um, based off of drift and mutational um, expectations to estimate um, how long it's been since this allele and this allele would coalesce or converge, right? And that is the overall model that we're using to understand how alleles exist in populations across all populations through time. Um, and one of the things that we can do in this process, right, is we can use it to understand rate questions. So, you know, how deep in the tree do we get the coalescent? Um, and this can help us understand the timing of when we might expect things to have occurred. Now, this approach that we're talking about of applying the coalescent is distinctly approach applied in the field of population genetics. And uh, I just want to review a few terms that come up frequently in population genetics. I know not all of you have had a lot of experience with it, um, but some terms that you're gonna run into as we um, talk about this topic include things like genetic diversity, which refers to the amount of variation in DNA sequence within a sample. We might talk about population bottlenecks, and this would be indicative of a loss of genetic diversity um, driven by a major decrease in population size. So when population size decreases dramatically, right, only a few individuals may survive and we lose a lot of the genetic diversity because we have less diversity in our population. Um, we'll often refer to and talk about um, populations that are structured or subdivided, and this refers to populations that are genetically distinct from each other um, or have differing patterns of genetic diversity or allele frequency. So even if we wanted to think about 
if we replaced species with population here, right, we have different sets of alleles in these different populations. We might expect that um, they would be structured in a certain way. Uh, there is a founder effect, um, which means that uh, that's explaining when we have a, an amplified genetic effect due to a low initial population size of an isolated subpopulation. So in other words, if you only have a few individuals starting a population, their, the genetics of that population will be highly determined by those individuals. And lastly, um, we can talk about admixture. And here we're referring to the genetic mixing of previously separated populations. So you have two distinct populations. They now come in contact and exchange genes. Um, and that is a process that we refer to as admixture. Um, I think it's important in this process to um, understand too that what, what we talk about, what we're really interested when we're looking at things, questions in population genetics um, has to do with uh, allele frequencies. And this is tied in part because of our understanding of what evolution is, which in a very strict def definition is a change in allele frequencies over time. And so we're able to take these sort of general terms, right, and translate them into very explicit math. And that math is um, the tracking of allele frequencies and the differences and similarities that we see of those allele frequencies, changes in those allele frequencies. So keep in mind that that's the context that we're often thinking about things when we think about population genetics. So what makes us human? Um, well, one thing we could do is we could look back and compare ourselves to um, some of our uh, uh, ancient biological relatives um, that still might exist today, uh, things like primates, um, but there's not a very good fossil record um, of these uh, uh, deep ancestral relatives. Um, modern humans have distinguishing, so despite the fact we talked about chimp before, you know, there's very little genetic di difference between us and chimp at um, a sequence level, uh, especially at a protein level. Um, but it seems like, uh, you know, we've got uh, there's been a lot of evolutionary time between us and them. Um, modern humans have distinguishing anatomical characteristics, biochemical, developmental, and behavioral features that all really cause us to be very different from other primates. So we're definitely not exactly the same. Um, and among the things that many have highlighted as being some of our uh, most important distinguishing characteristics are our conceptual and linguistic capacities. So we might think about where do these things come from? What is the origin of those features? And can we use genomics to examine that? Um, and this might help us to come to a better understanding and realization of what does it mean uh, to be a modern human. And one thing we can do for comparative genomicists is we might try to think about this by comparing these types of things to um, our ancestors. Um, but first, maybe we can use genomics to get a better understanding of where we come from. Right. So if we're going to do ancestral comparisons, um, it's also important that we know uh, what our origins are as a species. Um, one of the main uh, hypotheses that has become to me known most uh, well supported is the idea of the out of Africa hypothesis, which explains the origin of modern humans. Um, and uh, if you were to make a phylogenetic tree out of um, especially mitochondrial DNA, um, what you would see is that the base of that tree, the root of that tree, is firmly placed in Africa. Um, and you can see here over on the right in this figure from the, Lex, the Lesk text. Um, one of the ways we also can see why Africa is our most ancient population is that if we look, we see that the deepest branches and the deepest different differences, the largest number of sequence divergences are, uh, and the greatest amount of genetic variation is in Africa. 
So they have longer branches, deeper divergences among various groups in Africa. Um, and um, as we move away from Africa geographically, we also move away from Africa genetically. Um, African populations also have the lowest amount of linkage disequilibrium in their genome as compared to other populations of people. And this linkage disequilibrium, uh, this high amount of higher amount of linkage disequilibrium, um, is often a good indicator of where we might find our older populations. And there are some other markers too that support an origin in Africa of modern humans. For instance, if you look at the gut microbe Hel uh, Helicobacter pylori, um, we see the exact same pot pattern in this gut bacterium, where it mirrors the human, uh, its human host, where it's more diverse in Africa, and the farther you get away from Africa, the less genetic divergence you get, the less genetic diversity you get. Um, this led to a concept known as the mitochondrial Eve, um, where um, that was kind of the uh, clever way that uh, some scientists decided to address this idea. Um, and uh, that basically all mitochondrial DNA could be traced back to a single mother. Um, I think it's important that you understand that when we talk about this concept, though, what we're referring to is what's known as a lucky mother. So there was basically, if we go back on that coalescent um, example from before, right, there would have been one into one allele here, basically, that um, was one of a population of alleles that was actually able to persist. So it wasn't just that there was one allele at the beginning. Um, I think it's an important distinction. Uh, <clears throat> so it's not a very good um, metaphor, to be perfectly honest, uh, but you'll often hear it referred to. Um, so the time since the most recent common ancestor for all humans is somewhere between 100 to 200,000 years ago. So using these mitochondrial sequences, um, we can gain a lot of insight when we start to map them um, both in time uh, and in space. So in this case, um, we can take some of the original um, origin sequences, here are these L sequences, um, and we can put them into um, time and space. So if you look back about 150,000 uh, years ago, we can see that these sequences have their origin in um, these L1 sequences have their origin in Africa. We can see, um, start to see expansion and divergence within Africa. And these are those L1, L2, L3 lineages that we saw in the previous slide. And this is occurring around, you know, 800 to uh, 80,000 to 60,000 years ago. Um, after that, we start to see uh, migration out of Africa about 60 to 50,000 uh, years ago, um, and then spread throughout the <clears throat> sort of southern coast of the Indian Ocean and over into Australia. So kind of along um, uh, this part of the world. Um, after we see that, we see a, a, an additional movement out into um, sort of the eastern Mediterranean and other parts of Asia. <clears throat> and at this time, we would have seen interactions <clears throat> about 30,000 years ago with other ancient hominids, such as the Neanderthals. As we get to more recent time, we see that expansion continuing. Uh, and then eventually, um, movement uh, across the Bering Strait uh, of these Asian groups into North America. So we, and this is about 20,000 to 15,000 years ago. Uh, we then uh, experienced an ice age. <coughs> and this ice age uh, uh, pushed populations south. So this led to um, various groups either uh, 
changing groups in North America, migrating further south, being cut off from other groups up here in Asia, and um, also some recontact and admixture among these populations. Um, after warming, uh, we see uh, an expansion, sorry, during that, um, that period, right, we see um, further migration south into South America about 18,000 years ago. Uh, and then we see um, expansion back north after the uh, warming uh, uh, following the Ice Age in about 15,000 to 13,000 years ago. Um, there's another explosion of sudden warming um, that sort of stabilizes some populations and leads to some other migrations um, sort of within the Middle East and Africa. Also um, expansion um, a little bit of expansion here in um, South Asia. Uh, this warming is then followed by a period of really stable time, and this is around the time when we might expect to see the um, um, advent of agriculture, and then the expansion, once we have sort of these very stable populations and stable lineages, um, being able to be supported by things like agriculture and helping populations grow. We also see um, expansion of some of these other groups out to various islands. Um, and that would bring us about to, to approximately where we would consider the modern human populations to be. So this is approximately what um, the mitochondrial lineage distribution looks like um, in the world these days. So if we think about Getting back to this question, we can think about um, what makes us human. You know, understanding our origins is important uh, as a species, but you know, we're comparative genomics class. What what can we learn from looking at differences between you know ourselves and our similarities to our closest hominid ancestors? Um, and <clears throat> there are basically two main lineages for um, ancient hominid genomes. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll admit that, I'm, uh, that in this section, when I talk about hominids, I may not be completely up to date on everything because this is not <laughs> my exact specialty, but I'll give my best shot. Um, but basically there are two main um, ancient hominid genomes that we are, uh, hominid groups that we're most concerned with, the Neanderthals and, and the the Denisovans, and um, these two hominid lineages um, largely believed um, to be located in parts of um, Europe and Western Eurasia, uh, as well as um, parts of Asia as well, um, for, especially for the Denisovans. Um, the Neanderthal was first discovered um, and named because it was the uh, remains were remains were found in uh, the Neander Valley near Dusseldorf. Um, and right now, there's a little more than ten genomes I think currently for this organism. For the Denisovans, um, these were found first in Denisova Cave in Altai Mountains, which is in Siberia. Um, and I think there's more than five genomes right now, but uh, there's at least five out there. Uh, they're very closely related to modern humans at a sequence level. So we were actually able to isolate DNA. It's a pretty amazing process, the uh, process of paleogenomics. Um, uh, and there's a local expert in the region, in case you're curious, Beth Shapiro at UCSC is, is a well-known paleogenomicist. Her lab does really, really interesting work on a wide range of organisms, including things like ancient elephants, woolly mammoths, and whatnot. Um, but uh, there is um, a very high similarity to modern humans, um, but the Denisovans and the NFL are actually more similar to each other than they are to us. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, getting DNA out of these things and building genomes from them is a, is a kind of a fraught process. Um, it involves something referred to as paleosequencing, which is the isolation and sequencing of uh, ancient or extent um, species DNA. And what this basically means is that you have to collect deposits. Um, you have to collect DNA from deposits or mummified samples or 
eggshells and subfossil states because once it's fossilized, you can't get DNA out of it. Um, completely fossilized. Um, ancient bone, fur samples, preserved seeds, museum preserved specimens, or clinically collected pathogens, something like that. Um, and uh, for paleo sequencing to work, um, DNA is actually very stable. You know, we're able to sample things from hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, but the issue is that it's got to be pretty protected um, from moisture. Um, and this means it could be frozen, uh, but DNA is going to degrade if it's exposed to mo moisture at warm temperatures. Um, but when you do this, you're only going to get, you know, very small amounts of DNA. It's pretty challenging to get DNA out of here. Uh, but that's okay. And the reason why is we can use tools like we use in other molecular fields, things like uh, polymerase chain reaction to amplify our sequences. So we have um, more template. Uh, but there's can be lots of problems with this process. Uh, I think it's important to consider this as we go through. So there can be contamination of samples, right? Um, there can be fragmentation of the DNA. The DNA can be degraded. And when I talk about contamination, yeah, there could be contamination from other organisms, but there also could be con contamination from, from other humans, right? So <laughs> sequencing something that's only 0.15% divergent from us, we have to be very careful about um, the people who are conducting the research and how they might affect the sample. Um, these DNA are likely to be very fragmented, so very short, um, pieces of DNA, which can be, make it really challenging for um, the assembly of them into genome sequences. Um, they're also known to undergo a deamination process where Cs can be converted to uracils. Um, so uh, that has to be taken into consideration when thinking about how uh, we are coding and identifying these various nucleotides. So um, the first Neanderthal genome uh, came out of um, work by David Reich and Svante Pavo um, uh, with um, Eric, uh, Richard Green as the primary author. Uh, this came out in 2010. The first draft of the Neanderthal genome published in Science. Um, sorry, the organism was approximately their size, but they had a more robust um, uh, physique. We know this from a uh, fossil record. Um, it has, uh, this organism has a comparable, if not larger, cranial capacity. We know that they used tools, they had decorative arts, wore makeup, and had complex funeral practices. And when we sequenced DNA from their fossil, we found them, these fossils were about 100,000 100, years old. Uh, we found that uh, we could get a genome from this DNA, uh, and it was pretty challenging to so we were able to do it. Um, uh, the first genome was actually sequenced. It came out about 1x coverage. So that means that if the genome is a certain uh, number of nucleotides long, we sampled it 1.3 times. We covered one point, the genome, whole genome approximately one time based upon the amount of DNA that we were able to generate and then 0.3 times more. So it's just kind of like a, a single coverage. So it's not a very deep sequence. Um, this came from three individuals that were isolated from Croatia. And uh, this genome has now been um, revised multiple times. Um, in 2014, there was a 50x coverage from one individual. Um, and I think that there's, I don't know if there's been an update of it more recently than that, uh, if that's what the reference is they're still using or not. I would imagine that they have updated it since then, but I haven't found good evidence of, or I've been able to chase that down all that well myself. So that's the Neanderthal genome. Uh, Dennis Ovens um, were, uh, uh, again, occurring around the same time. Um, and there's been a few papers out about these as well. Um, again, a lot of the same players, David Reich, Richard Green, Svante Pabo, Bonnie Slatkin, uh, involved in Sam, in, uh, in one of the first genome uh, efforts in this organism. Again, a first genome was approximately around the same size, um, about 1.9x coverage from uh, one individual, a young girl's uh, bone finger. Um, <clears throat> and as of 2018, there was a 30x coverage genome from approximately three individuals. Um, so another high coverage genome coming through. Again, uh, many of the same people uh, involved in that process.
Um, what's actually been really interesting is that uh, in more recent time, we've now found an example of um, a hybrid. Uh, so an example where the offspring was a Neanderthal and the father was a Denisovan. Um, and uh, it's been an interesting uh, uh, thing that we found. So these two separate, what we, what we think of species, um, may actually been doing a lot more interbreeding than what we think. Um, may explain why they're more similar to each other than they were to us. One thing that's really interesting is that we do find, however, um, exam uh, evidence that we actually carry some Neanderthal data uh, DNA in our genome. So at some point back in history, um, there may have been some integration of um, Neanderthal DNA into our DNA because um, there's DNA that looks foreign to our genome. It's more similar to things that we'd find in Neanderthals than other humans. And one of the really interesting ways to show that is that there is no archaic DNA sequence in um, African populations. So remember, if we talk about that expansion out of Africa, at some point, uh, we expanded up into Europe and Asia. And at that point, we've had contact with Neanderthal and Denisovans. And it's possible that um, genome integ in, uh, integration occurred at those times. Uh, and one of the points of evidence is the fact that those African populations, which did not have contact with those um, other ancient hominids, don't demonstrate that. They don't have evidence of that. Uh, if we think about what this process might look through time, right? So we can see that there is, you know, um, hominin, if we see, you know, the total time, 80,000 years over which uh, hominin uh, species existed, there was migration from Africa uh, into Eurasia, sort of about somewhere between 800 to 500,000 years ago. We had our last common ancestor of all humans sort of placed in Africa. We had humans split from Neanderthals and Denisovans, and then a, and a later split from uh, Denisovans and Neanderthals. Um, we then see the emergence of the modern human um, much later, uh, around like 200,000 years ago, 150,000 years ago. We have modern uh, humans leaving Africa, expanding out of Africa after around like 80, 60, 50 um, thousand years ago. Um, and during that time, as they're expanding out and achieving a worldwide range, there is a period in which they're going to interact with um, Neanderthals and Denisovans. There's some evidence of crossbreeding and interbreeding at that time. Um, and then eventually um, these lineages end. So around this time, the Neanderthals are, are almost basically extinct. So if we think of it, it looks something like this is what we think is what their ranges were. And we can see that, um, you know, the directionality of these genomic introgressions, right? So we see um, that the Neanderthals introgressed and probably interacted with modern humans after the migration out of Africa. We see Denisovans uh, in, uh, um, interesting into human populations, specifically in Asia and Oceania, um, a little bit later on this tree. You know, so first we went into Europe, and then these Denisovian ones um, introgressed, and so we can see, you know, there are sort of very specific. Um, time points where we can identify uh, these introgression events. Um, and we can see that in modern humans by looking at the amount of, um, and the identity of um, uh, ancient uh, uh, Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA in our current existing DNAs, genomes. Um, and it's a pretty complicated picture, like that's kind of a simple way of thinking about, but if this is probably a, a good way of sort of understanding, you know, a more complicated process. Um, this is um, showing, you know, we start off with like our, our, our ancient um, relationships between chimps and archaic organisms. We then sort of branch out into these African and non-basal African lineages. We have um, the uh, Neanderthals sort of branch out here in um, the Altai group. We have Denisovans over here. And then as we migrate out of Africa, we spread to the east and the west. Um, and then you'll have some introgression events here, right, from the Neanderthals. 
and well as the Denisovan lineage um, introgressing into a few of these other lineages that are popping up in various places, like into this New Guinean and Australian lineage, for instance, uh, and also into this um, uh, lineage here, which is an Asian lineage. We do think that these types of contacts could have led to um, other sort of cultural advents where we see um, uh, things like uh, certain types of technological advancements, like the app, the usage of uh, Lavalois technology, which is kind of like that, you know, that classic, um, you want to think of like that stone axe with the chiseled parts on it. Um, that's actually a technological advancement, if you want to think of it, you know, being able to make that stone axe. And um, we think that the um, inner the interactions between humans and Neanderthal, which is indicative, which we can find genetic evidence for, um, that's also explained by the spread of that technology um, between the uh, among these groups as well. So um, there's some other evidence that can support um, the, these types of connectivity. So what do these data tell us? Um, well, one they um, show that. Uh, these organisms were closely related to us and that there's evidence for interbreeding both within those groups and between us and them, um, between Homo sapiens and uh, Neanderthals um, and Denisovans. Um, it shows uh, a range of variability in, in time and space of different populations. So this supports basically a split between Neanderthals and humans and then uh, uh, the eventual extinction of the Neanderthals. So um, these populations um, were thought to get uh, uh, smaller over time as humans outcompeted them, or they were unable to adapt to changes in the environment. Uh, it gives us clues to um, what is varying and evolving about lifestyles. Um, so uh, we can think about uh, the fact that um, we see evidence of duplication of an alpha amylase gene, which is used um, for the breaking down of starches and is indicative of an organism that eats a, has a higher starch diet in humans. So we see this expansion of this gene set in humans. We do not see it in Neanderthals. Um, so that is indicative of the different sort of um, lifestyle and um, cultural changes that may be associated with diet changes, uh, actually maybe things like agriculture um, that are, uh, that are, uh, far more um, uh, indicative of human populations than uh, Neanderthals. And one of the ones that is often seen as a, as a really big point of emphasis is um, understanding um, the origins of um, human speech. So we can look at specific genes and see like, well, how is this one gene involved? You know, what are the differences between we see between Neanderthals and us? And uh, we talked a little bit about this previously, but there's, you know, this gene called FOXP2, which is known as sort of the speech gene. Uh, it's incredibly important in our ability to um, to communicate orally um, and to use language. And when you have mutations in this gene, uh, modern humans have various disorders that are sociogenetic disorders where they can't communicate verbally or with language. Um, so it's very important, and then there's another gene called POU352F2, which is involved in the expression of this gene in the brain. And we can look at these specific genes and see distinct differences between us and Neanderthals or other ancient hominids. And uh, this is probably a, a really strong indicator of some of the genetic underlines of things that are different between us. We can also look at... Um, other things that contribute to modern human genetics, um, things like uh, our immune system, which is seen as one of the um, important evolution uh, 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 traits that has evolved um, for humans and is our ability to deal with disease. And so the evolution patterns associated with major histocompatibility, proteins and toll-like receptors and the expansion and the evolution of these genes is very indicative of human populations as opposed to um, Neanderthal. So in addition to you know, studying our own history and studying our most closely, our most close genetic relatives. Um, we can also learn a lot by studying the genomes of organisms that are closely uh, associated with humans. 
Um, and these can give us insights into the origins of civilization. So looking at things like crop domestication and animal domestication and technological innovation, you know, thinking about the fact that, you know, in our history, we were able to increase food production, which led to population growth in large communities and trade, which then led to specialized activities and other technological innovations and things like economic inequalities, which then led to government. Right. And so there's all different ways we think about um, how civilizations can evolve and change. And genomics can give us a perspective on this. Um, there are basically three types of evidence we could use in this case. There's archaeological evidence, there's genomic evidence, and linguistic evidence. Um, and so if we think of an example like agricultural in Europe, you know, the Middle East um, are harvesting wild barley and wheat and lentils uh, about 11 thousand years ago, um, they had domestic cattle, sheep, goats, pigs, you know, around the same time. Um, and then this spread, we see evidence of this spreading archaeologically um, to the Middle East and then into Southern Europe and then into Northern Europe. Um, and what we can do is we can use genomic evidence to, um, to follow these migrations and to trace the histories of these biological um, adaptations of domestication and, uh, and other types of um, inventions related to agriculture. Um, and one of the things that we can do is we can also say like, well, what is the origin of these types of traits and are there common things about it that help us understand, for instance, why we um, were looking at organisms like dogs and cows and and cattle as opposed to other organisms in terms of their domestication. Looking at questions like what are the features and of domestication and how do genomics contribute to our understanding of that um, is, a, is a really important component in sort of understanding why the, the animals and plants that we've become so closely associated with, you know, what what is the purpose of, of that and how has that come about and why those organisms versus other ones. Um, and it really helps us understand, you know, our interactions and our history, uh, our interactions with the world, our history. We think about animals, you know, when we think about what's important for domestication. We're talking about uh, docility, herding, social ability to manipulate a social hierarchy, <clears throat> um, ability to breed easily, um, and rapid growth and maturity. When it comes to plants, um, we might have some different types of criteria that we're going to focus on such as, you know, uh, are, can we easily obtain seed and and harp and store those seeds and harvest? Can we select for enlarged fruits or seeds? You know, flavor, nutrition, synchronized harvest time is a big one in agriculture that we might not think about all the time, but having synchronous harvest time is really important in terms of effort. Um, agriculturally flav uh, favorable morphology, um, so like having a, a central large stock and things coming off it and, uh, versus multiple stocks. Um, no shattering, so reducing sort of the process of seed dispersal and increased self-pollination so you don't have to rely on pollinators to affect your yield. These are all, you know, phenotypic characteristics that we think are really important or really helpful in domestication. And... We can see how selection for these things has altered the genomes of these organisms. So if we think about something like dogs, um, dogs uh, 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 and the domestication of dogs, they share about 99.95% of their genomes with wolves, so very similar to wolves. Um, they're the wild ancestor of dogs, like the literal wild dog. Um, has actually been lost, uh, what we think was the, the ancestor of wolves and dogs, which is this uh, tamir back about 35,000 years ago. Um, but uh, since then, since they are so closely related, there's actually been quite a bit of genetic exchange between wolves and dogs. Um, the origins of this uh, animal are thought to be in East Asia, in the Near East, um, and from what we understand, it sort of underwent two major bottlenecks in, along dogs. There was the bottleneck when there was originally domestication, and then the bottleneck that came subsequently after that is related to the formation of modern breeds, which is very recent. Um, 
It's thought that there are sort of like three stages to domestication. There was sort of this pre-domestication state of this ancestor where these were um, sort of scavengers. There was the advent of domestication, which the first evidence for that um, is thought to have occurred about 33,000 years ago. And then that practice has sort of migrated west over time at 15,000 years, 10,000 years by the time it hit Europe. Um, so we have that, that first domestication event. And then we have the diversification of breeds, which really has only been going on about the last 200 years or so. So if you think of what we think of modern dogs, those have only really existed um, just in, in recent history. Uh, <clears throat> We can think about like the different ways that w when we look at dog genomes, and we're actually going to read a whole paper on uh, dog genomes too, which is interesting. Um, but we're going to use that as actually a, a way of looking models for models of aging. But um, there's all other things that we can learn from dogs, right? And if we look at their genomes, we can do things like look at uh, you know the genomics of their psychology. So you know what are the processes that are related to um, aggression. You know, there's been lots of instances where dogs have been selected either for or against being aggressive um, for whatever type of breed we have. We can look at their genetics and try to figure out how that works. Um, and then also we could do things like see how, um, you know, by under better understanding their genome, we might be able to better understand processes of memory and learning because we know that we can teach dogs and, and they learn in very different ways and, and that depends on the different breeds, right? And we can look at things like how that how the ner nervous system develops. Um, as we look at some of this data, I want to talk a little bit about showing you some of this data on sort of dog genomes, but to really explain it well, um, I want to show you a certain type of um, data analysis, data presentation, data visualization method that's known as a principal components analysis. And um, it's, a, it's a widely used uh, data analysis tool. It's not typically taught in early statistics, so I'm not sure if very many people in the class have familiarity with it, but I just wanted to introduce it as it'll pop up periodically in some of the um, papers that we're going to be reading. Um, and what principal um, components analysis is, is it's a way to sort of describe the underlying structure in structure of data, specifically um, multi-dimensional uh, data. And, it, and what we do is we're looking at multiple dimensions of data and we want to reduce it down to something that our little human minds can understand, right? So we can't really think of visually represent data that's sort of in more than three dimensions very easily. Um, so what we do in this case is we're trying to reduce the dimensionality of our data set. So the number, of, every time you measure something, you have a response variable of one of one thing that you're measuring. So it's multivariate, your response. Um, every variable that you add on to that um, creates another dimension to your data, right? And so here we want to reduce our dimensionality down to something that's a little more conceivable for us. Um, and uh, that would be two dimensions, right? And so um, these methods um, were originally developed um, back in the early 1900s. Um, and what happens is you take your multidimensional data and you're, you draw it in some sort of space. And in that space, um, uh, you'll notice that like you, know, you get a cluster of points. And what you'll do is that you'll try to find um, the plane. Uh, uh, you're going to try to draw a line basically through these points that explains the most amount of the variation. So in other words, you want to try to find about you know, which line um, does its best about explaining the most amount of this data. So, you know, is, you can see how much variation, how much spread in your data, right? Is this line a better expl ex explanator of the data or is this line, right? So this line shows more of the variation. And so we would say that this is probably going to be the first principal component of your data. Right, and so um, what you'll do after that is the next principal component of your data will be drawn um, in a direction that's orthogonal to to this first line. And what you're in this whole process, what you're doing is you're actually describing how much of the variation in your data is explained by this line. And um, 
what this looks like is we say have our cloud of data points, right? We draw our line through it and we establish the first principal component. Um, we then draw a line orthogonal to that, and that's going to be our second principal component. We then shift this and make that our new X and Y. And now we can see, you know, along which direction these, um, this multi-dimensional data, which is now presented in two dimensions, has been reoriented. And what X and Y represent is not just one measurement, right? So it's not like we're just looking at like, um, body, like uh, body size and temperature or something like that. What, what you're looking at is an axis which describes multi-dimensional data. And um, so say we measure something and we're measuring um, body size and weight and um, color and uh, fat content and um, uh, response to temperature, right? Like, so there's like a bunch of different things that we're measuring. What this actually represents is this could represent all five dimensions of the data, and this could represent all five dimensions of that data as well. But what you see is often it'll be one, one uh, factor, one variant, or more than a couple variants that are sort of the dominant factor in determining the direction of this of this and the amount of variation on this principal component. So say often, for instance, when you do that PCA, like the first principal component will be highly correlated with patterns associated with body size. So body size can be a, a main contributor to the um, to what causes variation along this axis, whereas perhaps it's um, weight, which is a major contributor to um, uh, variation along this axis. And you can assess that. So that's what it is. It's basically trying to take multi-dimensional data, put it in two dimensions, and then what we see is that, like you know, these samples are going to be more similar to each other than these samples, right, along this axis, and these samples are going to be more similar to each other than these. They're going to be different from these samples along this axis, right? But we can see, for instance, that like um, uh, other other samples. Um, you know, so even though these samples are very different from each other on the x-axis, they're very similar to each other on the y-axis. So there are so uh, various patterns that we can observe. But what we are looking for is the relative sort of placement of these points in space and seeing how that might tell us something about the nature of those data points. So if we look at something like a PCA um, showing that uh, for the different genetic markers in dogs, and this shows Points that are close to each other basically are more genetically similar to each other. Points that are far from each other are more genetically distant from each other. We can see um, really distinct patterns in what are the genetic relationships between these groups. So, you know, dogs are generally more related to each other than they are to other groups. Those, this would mean that they've kind of evolved as their own monophyletic group. Um, but they do have some crossover and similarity to wolves, which makes a lot of sense, given what we've talked about their evolutionary history being. But we can saw, see there are other groups here that are less related to dogs, like red wolves and um, jackals, and especially the foxes, which have kind of formed their own group out over here. Furthermore, if we look at these wolves, we can see that there's actually really distinct differences between wolves um, that sort of match other geological patterns we might have expected to see. So we see that among the wolves that, you know, we're up in sort of northern uh, eastern Asia, um, the old world wolves, you know, sort of in um, Europe and Asia um, have are look very genetically distinct from the ones that are in um, North America and in New World. Um, and this is probably due to separation during that ice age that we talked about earlier in the, in the talk. Um, we also see that uh, in other examples of old, war, old world wolves, um, we can see there's even further um, genetic distinctions um, and uh, diversity spread across you know, where Israel and India um, and even China in some regard have very different, uh, uh, look to be pretty distinct from say wolf populations we might see in Sweden, although we do see a sort of a few outliers here. Um, but the Spanish group too looks to be um, somewhat distinct um, from these other groups. Um, we also see that um, within the New World, um, some of this process of geographical isolation of these wolf groups as well, where say like Northern Quebec is quite, it's quite um, uh, 
different from, say, uh, what we see in Isle Royale or Minnesota, for that matter, right? Um, but we see some um, overlap in some of these other groups, so they're not as, as much diverged, right? Um, and so some of these populations could be more isolated and not exchanging as much um, genetic information that can account for some of this um, distinctiveness. Um, but what it does show is, um, you know, sort of the, um, the distribution of genetics that's, that's associated here and how that might then be related to the evolution of dogs. What's really, one thing, really cool thing, though, is if we think about um, comparing dogs to, um, uh, to a species like wolves, one of the things that's, that's, that's been noted from looking at dog genomes is that there's a lot of linkage disequilibrium in dog genomes. And linkage disequilibrium means that you have these sections of the genomes in which, you know, all the, the whole section is um, not recombining very frequently. So it's all inherited or passed on in these long sections. Um, and so uh, they're more associated with each other. Genes along the genome or within the genome are more associated to each other than they would by, be by chance. They're linked. And so you get these linked segments. Now in dogs, those linked segments are a few megabases long, and that's about a hundred times longer than what they are in humans. So you have this large section of their genes, these are sections of these genomes which are inherited um, all together. And uh, what's interesting um, is that if we look at linkage states equilibrium in other organisms like cows, um, we can see that they also have a greater level of um, linkage to equilibrium than what we see in humans. And guess what? It also uh, happens in plants too. Um, so what le what's leading to these higher rates of linkage disequilibrium? Um, that's a really good question to ask. And one of the thoughts is that this is um, sort of what, uh, you know, when we select for domestication, we're sort of driving this process. I mean, one, we're probably not starting with a large population of organisms, but two, um, for organisms like dogs and cows, when we're doing domestication selection and we're selecting on specific traits, we're selecting for you know the ability to pass on these traits to the next generation pretty hard. And so having being able to select for a suite of traits all at one time for a large region that, of linked genes, as opposed to each gene individually, um, could be really advantageous in the process of um, uh, domestication. So that could be one of the characteristics that allows for certain organisms to be um, susceptible to domestication is whether or not we can select in these large linkage groups. Another really important um, organism for us um, in our history uh, as humans is um, looking at the domestication of the horse. So, I mean, you might not think about it, but horses had enormous cultural impact in human history. They are uh, enormous drivers of technology and social organization. Uh, we think about a pre-industrial age, there were few things as important as horses in, in many cultures. Um, they provided meat and milk. Um, they allowed for the development of nomadic lifestyle. Um, they spread up the spread of goods and information. And this included things like languages and knowledge and beliefs. They absolutely transformed warfare um, from what it was to something completely different. And um, they spurred all kinds of other technological advancement, you know, transportation, um, entertainment. You know, there's, a, there's any number of things that they helped drive. Um, and for horses, kind of similar to dogs, we, we saw them as having about three different stages of domestication. So um, there was one where horses were kept in herds. Um, this is probably about 7,000 years ago. Um, and then people figured out that, you know, there's a lot of benefit to being able to ride these horses. So there was a period after that where um, the, we were, uh, the, the horses were being domesticated for riding purposes. And then finally, um, horses to be able to pull wagons and chariots. If we look back at sort of the progenitor of horses, the progenitor of horses was this Equus ferris ferris, which has now gone extinct. Um, and, um, you know, this this was back about um, uh, you know uh, thirty six three hundred sixty thousand years ago um, where we had the the first sort of uh, 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 ancestor the Przewalski horse uh, 
um, and then the modern horses, which came about 300,000 years ago. Um, and uh, one thing that's pretty interesting about modern horses is the way that, that they're structured is typically there's a lot more genetic diversity in female lineages than there are in male lineages. And this probably has a lot to do with how humans were selecting for females and males, right? So um, they didn't need a lot of males typically in these in these herds, and they, you know, females were more valued because they could produce more horses. Um, and so there's this disparity actually in um, the amount of genetic diversity in, in the sexes, which is kind of unexpected. But you know, here, you know, they're great for understanding different types of features than dogs, right? So we can look at, at their genomes and get a better understanding of things like musculature and cardiac func cardiac cardiac function and other different types of brain development than we would if we were looking at something like dogs. Um, so along with animals and all the unique ways that their genomics can give us insight into some of these characteristics, um, plants have also been incredibly important to us as domesticated um, collaborators in a lot of ways. Um, so the transition to agricultural ag agriculture is really one of the, the principal changes in human activity that allowed for the evolution of culture and, and, and for where we are today. Um, and it led to major changes in human activity, diet, socioeconomic organization, um, maybe even our own microbiome. So even our own biology changed dramatically with the advent of agriculture. Um, and one of the things that's you know sort of well known about domesticated plants is that there's far less diversity in domesticated plants as compared to their wild cousins, right? And this is due to a variety of things. One, population bo bottlenecks. So we started with just a few organisms of that type, and then and then uh, selected on them. Uh, we use very strong selection to select for the traits that we thought were really most important, and. Um, it's really interesting to see that when we look at the, the genes that were related to domestication, there's kind of a combination of ones that were selected for and others that just sort of, um, there were these happy accidents or, or these de novo mutations that happened that were then we could then select on. So that's one of the nice things about plant genomes is, is that sometimes we, we grow them in such large numbers we can find um, beneficial variants. So let's look at something like maize. Uh, Zaya Mace. Um, so, uh, you know, this was an incredibly important crop for pre Columbian Central and South American cultures. Um, it uh, is currently, I think, the first to third largest crop in the world, um, depending upon the year. Um, it originated from a grass um, uh, called a teosinte. Um, which is found in southern Mexico, uh, and they started deriving it um, actually about like nine, uh, six to nine thousand years ago. Uh, what's one of the really interesting things here? Is some of the earliest artifacts um, found related to this were actually discovered by an undergraduate student doing like undergraduate research. So you too, as an undergraduate, could find um, some uh, really amazing discoveries in, in your work here at universities. Um, one thing about maize and teosinte is that um, they are still interfertile, so they can still breed with each other. Um, so there's an example over here. Um, uh, we have maize, we have teosinte. Um, you can see they look very similar to each other. Um, teosinte has, uh, uh, still shares many things with maize. Um, they have a large number of antiviral genes. Um, but unlike maize, you know, corn, which has lots of kernels, what we're looking at with teosinte are these, they only have about five to 12 kernels and they're surrounded by this thing called gloom, which protects the seed. What happened in domestication was that we saw um, enhanced loss of genetic diversity. So um, the, the domestication bottleneck uh, and then we see about 1,200 genes um, that uh, uh, seem to be affected uh, um, by this by this bottleneck process, and about 50 specifically related to what we think are agriculturally relevant traits. Um, specifically, there are two genes, TB1, which is um, related to lateral shoot development, so allowing 
you know, the, the maize to, dry, to shoot to form that corn stalk that we're so familiar with, right? Um, so it allows lateral shoot development and tassels to ears. Um, and one of the interesting things about this is that um, it's related, the, this gene is actually uh, uh, um, related to transposon activity where the presence of the transposon actually increases expression um, and um, allows for more lateral shoot development, whereas if it's absent, um, we get a decrease in the shoot size. Um, then there's uh, TGA1, which is a gloom structure gene. And what happened here was actually there was a non-synonymous mutation in this gene, TGA, in maize that allowed for um, uh, uh, the protein to no longer be able to be functional, to work appropriately. And this led to these glooms no longer forming appropriately and the exposure of the kernel. So we can see that, you know, these sort of happy accident, happy accident specific selection for mutations leading to um, ears uh, and shoot development. So now we get, you know, uh, larger pieces of corn, higher stalks, and also um, no gloom are really important steps in the evolution of this domestic organism. And we can see that this, this happens pretty rapidly in these organisms, right? Um, and, and, and it was a pretty dramatic change in the patterns of genetic diversity of these organisms. What's interesting is if we compare that to something like chocolate, right? So chocolate or um, Teobroma cacao, the cacao tree, um, has a very different story. So there's about 14 different cultivars of this tree. And um, one of the things that's really interesting about cacao trees is that they're not really all that um, different, the ones that we cultivate. They're not really all that different as compared to their wild um, brothers and sisters. Um, they're not really all that genetically modified. Um, if we look at their genomes, um, one of the big questions in looking at their genomes are people are interested in like, because uh, these, these trees can be susceptible to disease and they have very different tastes, these 14 different cultivars. And some of them are preferred for chocolate production and some of them are not. So people were interested in understanding. It seemed like the ones that were preferred for chocolate seemed to be more susceptible to specific types of disease, especially I think that there's one specific fungal pathogen that attacks them. Um, so they want to see, is there some sort of trade-off between taste and disease that we can see um, as evidence in their genome? Um, and one of the things that you do find is if you look at some of the, the, the favored um, strains that people like to eat, um, you see an expansion of the flavonoid and the terpenoid biosynthesis genes, gene pathways. So the genes that are in these um, gene pathways, they have more of them to make all these different, maybe more complex, more beneficial flavors. Um, there's also a lack or a loss of um, uh, what are known as toll interleukin receptor motifs. Um, and so these are sequence motifs that we would find in a specific type of kinase protein, which is related to toll receptor activity, which is involved in immune function. So it looked like, you know, they, these favored um, cacao trees had more flavor genes and less immune genes, and that was the reason why it was going on. So figured, well, look, the genome has been informative. It must be gene expansion driving this process. Um, but actually, uh, if you look at the process, um, it doesn't necessarily seem that that's the only explanation. It's a little more complicated than that. And, you know, if we look at, at sorry, if we, I didn't quite explain this. If we look at this, you know, explanation and this people are looking at is they're looking over here at Teobroma and trying to figure out, okay, well, what does this thing have that all these other organisms don't? Like, you know, we look at Arabidopsis and poplar trees and other organisms Right, we can see what genes are shared between them and what genes are specific to them. And these specific genes, maybe those are related to like the specific aspects of that organism that makes it special. You know, in Teobroma's case, these flavonoid and terpenoid genes that it's expanding, and maybe in some of these other ones that are more resistant to um, uh, uh, disease, maybe they have some genes that Teobroma is lacking, right? So we can look at the presence and absence of these genes.
Um, but it looks like the, this is actually a little bit more complicated. And that's because if we look at the uh, Udicot ancestor of um, all these plants, right, what we see is that there was actually um, uh, a lot of polyploidation that happened. There's a, a, at least a three copy um, uh, hexaploid, paleohexaploid ancestor of this thing. And, and then, you know, what is actually more likely is not that genes were expanded into these different categories, but it may be that genes were lost among these different categories. Um, because especially if we think about um, uh, cacao trees, it seems like they're more basal and more closely related to this uh, eudicot ancestor than a lot of these other organisms. So interestingly, there seems to be um, some, uh, you know, what we may be looking at is more like a, a global pattern of gene loss as opposed to gene expansion. So just an interesting way where, you know, sometimes the story looks one way, but actually um, it's important to put our genomes into this comparative context, because if we're not, then we may miss out on some of the, the reasons and or, or explanations for why we see the patterns we see. So uh, that's uh, the lecture on genomics and anthropology. I hope this helps you to understand, you know, we can use genomics as a tool to really investigate um, both our history and our biology in a way and the biology of the organisms that have inter we've interacted with in our history to better understand ourselves and, and how we are at the place we are today. Um, this, of course, ignores all the other ways that we use genomics in sort of more of a modern contemporary context, but I think this is a, a useful way to um, see these connections and, and a very useful tool in understanding these processes.